Hello, everyone, uh, and uh, thank you for joining our session today. Uh, my name is Alex Goldblatt. I'm a product manager on uh, the backup and recovery team. Um, today, uh, we're going to present uh, with my peer, Kayla Smith, and uh, the topics that we're going to cover are right here on your screen. Just to remind everybody that if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to post it in the Q&A. Otherwise, uh, we can take uh, live questions later in the session before we're going to wrap up. So the first topic uh, uh, is uh, basically an attempt to answer uh, some lingering questions regarding uh, deduplication and so the effects uh, of the encryption on the Oracle database uh, uh, source site. And uh, the reason why we kind of decided to rehash this uh, conversation um, just simply because uh, we have uh, quite a few questions coming in the case of the uh, enablement of the encryption related to, to the ransomware protection, related to the security constructs, related to a lot of um, new modern issues that you can see emerging uh, over the past few years. And so the second part of the session, uh, Kelly is going to be presenting on uh, some uh, use cases uh, specifically related to, to the cloud deployments of the uh, newly released uh, autonomous recovery service in the OCI cloud. So uh, let's talk about duplication a little bit. And uh, the way that uh, I would like to approach this is just to remind like where it all originated, how it all started. Why do we see specific effects uh, related to, to the security implications on the overall effectiveness of the duplication technology? And so to me, um, it all basically started back in 2002, 2003, when um, uh, EMC introduced a new so-called content addressable storage to the markets. It was basically tape replacement. So it was specifically targeted to regulated environments uh, for the archived data. And the uniqueness of this uh, technology introduced back then was uh, it was the first attempt to, to actually not to have like a, a NAS or SAN type of the uh, accessible storage over the fiber channel. Uh, it was the first uh, uh, attempt to introduce IP-based uh, storage and uniqueness of the access methods was predicated on the so-called fingerprinting. So instead of the um, you know like uh, normal addresses, uh, you out of nowhere you just uh, see a specific fingerprint that is uh, being retained on the application side, and then you can send query to the backend and uh, then the patch uh, this unique object. And uh, the first uh, hash algorithm was uh, built on the MD5, and MD5 hash was pretty unique by nature. Uh, it was just a first development of this type of the accessibility. So. Uh, there are quite a few things that's uh, kind of emerged out of this new technology. One of them was a mathematical model that was introduced uh, a couple of years later after the first release of the storage. And the um, model was uh, uh, just to prove the possibility of uh, having two different objects generating the same fingerprints. And even though that's the uh, probability of such events was absolutely negligible, uh, they, uh, the outcome out of this mathematical research was to enhance the overall fingerprinting technology. And so this is how emerged new things related to the new algorithms such as uh, SHA-256, SHA-1, SHA-2. So depending on the what type of the um, vendor and what was the specific uh, uh, hash algorithm used uh, uh, as uh, the tool of choice, you can see a, a little bit uh, different flavors of how they generate fingerprinting. So this is not exactly kind of uh, across the board, so just a common denominator that so all the fingerprints are going to be equal. That's absolutely not true. It's uh, specific to the, um, like I said, to the storage technology that is being used on the news. And so a couple of new things that were um, introduced along the same way. Um, as I can imagine, if you're talking about the IP and if you're talking about so the MD5 based hash um, as the um, kind of identifier of the object, I, they had to introduce a set of APIs. And so back then it was uh, um, kind of built as of the standards and the SNEA committee actually uh, run the standardization across uh, the entire industry for this uh, new venture. Um, but the uh, interesting outcome and side effect that it was basically probably typical REST APIs that uh, we know today. So a lot of goodness came out of this uh, new research and uh, new storage builds. So um, how DDoP actually works kind of on the high level? Uh, there are two basic approaches. One is a so-called fixed block algorithm. Another one is uh, 
uh, the variable length uh, segmentation or cache algorithm. And so uh, it is predicated on the two levels of the fingerprinting. So one was um, the same that was embedded by CAS, uh, how to identify unique objects. But uh, the second uh, um, kind of level of the um, uh, fragmentation or uh, segmentation and uh, uh, MD5 fingerprinting is on the uh, sub object on the block size. Now, how it actually works, it's uh, you create uh, the um, first fingerprint on the object level. You say it is unique in the system. Then you go a step further and you chop it into the blocks. Uh, for the fixed one, typically you can see two or four K chunks. Each one of them is being fingerprinted. So why? Because uh, uh, there might be two separate objects, but they can carry identical data. For example, two rounds of the backup of the same database or two rounds of the backup of the uh, same database in different cadences. So there are uh, some uh, more efficient um, databases or more efficient objects that can be chopped apart and uh, identified, like for example, um, um, SQL database or um, exchange. So Microsoft Exchange is uh, uh, well known for the efficiency of the duplication simply because all the net new data in the exchange uh, being appended to the tail of the object. So effectively you can dedupe it so close to 99% on the daily basis. And so the variable segmentation is a little bit more uh, consuming. And so the reason why it's more consuming uh, on the uh, front end on the CPU resources is very simple. The um, variable length segmentation is predicated on identification of the net new data within the object. So for example, if I have an object and I have uh, changes in the middle of the bit stream, the uh, fixed block will fail to identify such a change and most likely the effectiveness of the duplication is gonna be pretty low. Unlike fixed, uh, variable is actually uh, does a little tricks uh, uh, manipulating uh, the boundaries of the blocks. So uh, theoretically, this uh, uh, variable length segmentation and fingerprinting is uh, a little bit more efficient than the fixed, depending on the data source, of course. Um, but yet again, it comes at the cost, so just simply because of the calculation, additional calculations that you have to run at uh, the uh, host. So uh, this is just some basic schematics just to show how DDoP storage works, um, like basically 10,000 miles of you. So you have a first uh, object in the system, you run it, so you chop it apart, you calculate the fingerprints, you send the fingerprints uh, to the mothership, to the actual server. And the server has uh, two layers. One is the indexing part that actually contains metadata, including fingerprinting. And it uh, has a reference model to the actual storage. So basically when you send data to the storage, you have the same uh, identification by the fingerprints and it also being chopped apart and you have uh, separate segments. You have a second uh, object in the system. It has identical fingerprints, so you don't back it up, right? And so you just create a reference that uh, you have two objects and they are identical because of the object fingerprinting. And you don't do like any chopping, you don't use any, any sub object uh, um, uh, identification on the block level. But if the object is unique in the system, then you do exactly the same like you did so with the first one. You create the object fingerprint in the, uh, um, in the indexing layer and so you send uh, data to the storage cell, but you don't send the entire object, you send only unique segments that were identified in the system. So um, going like one step further, okay? And so um, the uh, evolution of the duplication storage uh, um, was pretty rapid. And so uh, there were quite a few issues that emerged. Um, uh, for example, one of the most uh, difficult uh, challenges um, were because uh, the unlike tape drive, uh, duplication storage is basically uh, unpredictable in a sense where to find so the segment, where to find the object in the system. So uh, with uh, the uh, new object being sent to the backend so, and so old object being uh, deleted from the system, it created a lot of uh, fragmentation. And fragmentation of the disk leads only to one thing, bad news. And the bad news came pretty fast uh, when uh, the, uh, from the historical perspective, uh, over 30 days uh, period, uh, the recovery speeds uh, from the deduplication storage was falling by 90%. Uh, from the performance standpoint. So, so it basically became non-competitive. So uh, to solve all these challenges and to solve uh, issues related to sometimes breaking model between the indexes and the storage itself, 
uh, which was pretty often back then, um, uh, a lot of fancy technology emerged. So like, for example, garbage collection or the uh, containerization of the blocks, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, I'm not going to go through all this kind of massive list of the advanced technologies that uh, today actually comprise of the deduplication technology, but so you just know that it is extremely complex. It became uh, much more complicated over the past decades, and uh, um, it still keeps improving because there, are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of room for the improvement to start with. And so then uh, came a long conversation uh, where deduplication is more effective. Is it client-side deduplication or is it a server-side deduplication? So here is just an example. Um, I used the data main boost, but um, from the get-go, uh, for example, uh, Veritas NetBackup used client deduplication. Uh, they do not have uh, the backend deduplication uh, effectively. Um, data domain obviously came up as the server duplication, but so then they realized that if they will offload a little bit of processing to the source, like the same breaking up into the segments, so the same compression, the same encryption, the same source duplication, you will send less data over the wire. And so you will lighten the load on the server itself. It makes a lot of sense. Uh, it is definitely much more effective, but it comes at the cost. And the cost is uh, twofold. Number one, a client has uh, to retain set of the hash fingerprints at the source. Um, because otherwise, uh, they're going to have to go back to the server and that's the same question. Do you have it? Do you have it? Do you have it? Right? And just to get an answer if I need to send data. So even just excessive chitness on the, um, on the IP side uh, comes pretty at the hefty price. So they have to keep cash. Um, with so the MD5 uh, cache fingerprints um, or at the source. And so they have to run a lot of processes, like the same fingerprinting, right? And so the same uh, compression and the same encryption, right? So it all costs on the production side. Uh, another uh, good thing that came out of the deduplication is uh, the synthetic full. Um, and what is uh, the definition of the synthetic full? Uh, I have my old backup, and then I uh, chop my new backup, and I identify that uh, the new backup uh, consists 95% uh, of the old data. But at the same time, I'm not just creating the backup, the new object in the backup system on the, source, on, on the, on the storage side, but I can also create a point in time and say, listen, uh, in reality, I can't just say that uh, my new backup comprised of the old data and new data, and all I have to do is just uh, to rebuild the pointers and to say this is my uh, new backup comparing to the old one. So I retain old backup, I can recover from the old backup, I have my new backup, but at the same time I have efficiency of the storage consumption and I do not have to run full backup from this point on. So Another advanced technology here is the notion of the incremental forever. Um, not all data sources actually allow to create incremental forever. Uh, and uh, we will talk about it so just in a second. So uh, what is the fundamental difference of the Oracle Zero Data Loss Recovery Appliance and so the overall technology that uh, applies to both uh, uh, OCI Cloud Service Recovery Service that was released uh, earlier this year, just using exactly the same technology. So on this service, um, if we're going to take a look at uh, how uh, Oracle Recovery Appliance works, it looks awfully similar. Okay, so you have a source database. Uh, we know how to identify change blocks. We send it to the server. We can um, move the pointers and we can create a point in time. So all the goodness that we just discussed, such as virtual synthetics, such as point in time and incremental forever definitely applies to this uh, recovery appliance technology overall, right? So we see a, a amazingly less backup uh, on the performance on the source side. So we have much more efficient uh, uh, storage consumption on the backend. So it looks awfully alike just uh, like um, uh, data domain woods or the net backup um, um, backup storage. So it looks like, but it doesn't work this way. And the reason why it doesn't work this way is very simple. 
to do something like that. So for the Oracle databases, you actually have to reside inside of the database. You have to know the structure because it's so complex. And uh, typical vendors just use the basic ARMIN operations with the uh, level zero, false, and level one incrementals. And then you can run specific ARMIN operations uh, to create the version synthetic, which is uh, gonna come at the additional cost, of course. But uh, they can't basically just go and uh, to chop for uh, ARM and um, um, bitstream in uh, the bits and bytes and just to treat it like uh, any other backup. Uh, unlike uh, traditional backup vendors, so we do not use just chopping, actually. We do not use this type of the chopping at all. What we do use is the uh, mechanism which is called block change tracking. Uh, it can be turned on and off at the source, of course. But if it's turned on, uh, recovery plans knows how to identify what is actually new in the system and to do just specific with this change in blocks, just like uh, you would see from the traditional duplication for any other source. We know how to deal with uh, redo transports. We know how to create a specific, what we call delta push, uh, identifying the bulk of the new data just being sent to the backend. And just to remind um, the uh, overall deduplication in the normal world, you would not see like any efficiency of deduplicating data files versus, uh, versus archive logs. It's virtually impossible. So long story short, uh, there are a few side effects. One is what is happening if you turn encryption at the source? Will it affect uh, the uh, VCT transport? The answer is no. Unlike traditional deduplication, we know how to deal with it. So because, again, because we know uh, what is happening inside of the database and because of the uniqueness of the coexistence of our backup technology with the uh, database development, uh, we can provide this type of the efficiency, but in the, a little bit unique way. Uh, what else is happening with BCT? Uh, another thing is on the effectiveness of the um, block identification in the sense of the uniqueness. We do have the same thing in printing, but unlike uh, any other uh, technology, uh, we do not treat the entire 128K segments uh, from data files. Um, because we know what is new in the system, we ship much less overall new data to the backend, to the storage itself. So if, for example, you're gonna take uh, 10 terabytes in size uh, of the database, and uh, hypothetically 2% change ratio, the uh, traditional method is gonna be reading uh, all 10 terabytes uh, and subsequently 200 gig uh, with the L1s. Uh, we do not do this, we just identify what is actually unique and send it to the backend, therefore the, uh, even the data movements is much more efficient. So let's talk about uh, encryption because uh, this is exactly where we head into. Um, now what is happening if you will enable encryption at the source? So number one, uh, compression and encryption introduce a global change into the bitstream. It's just the nature of the beast. And, uh, there is no any magic bullets that uh, can be used in the traditional way. Once uh, bitstream is changed, uh, Deduplication, as we discussed, will identify that you have all new unique objects in the system and will start to do a fingerprinting, chopping, and fingerprinting of the block level. So uh, if you're going to go and take a look at the uh, guidelines of, for the traditional vendors, uh, all of them saying the same. Do not use ARM and compression and do not use source encryption. So obviously it contradicts um, um, the um, notion of the secured environment. And so again, the ransomware protection, everybody's aware of it. Um, people start to turning on TD encryption at the source, right? But at the same time, it kills efficiency of the traditional deduplication. So if you're gonna take a look at so the uh, little expert um, uh, from the uh, uh, guidelines uh, for the ARM, and as you can see, all supported versions of farming can apply binary compression algorithm. The result is in less GIG space uh, um, being used at uh, the cost of the significantly greater CPU consumption. And again, this is coming exactly from what we just discussed. Once you turn it on, 
there is no magic. Uh, the object has got to be read in full. Uh, it's got to be processed in full. And if you can recollect, uh, because everybody's using now, the client deduplication is going to cost you because it's going to be overloading a production environment. So this effect, again, applies to any other backup vendor, but uh, to the recovery appliance. So, so because of the uniqueness of our approach, because of the uniqueness of our technologies. So um, if uh, you will refer, and um, I will provide a link uh, to the security guide. If you will uh, refer to the advanced security guide so for Oracle database, you will see that so once uh, TD is enabled, uh, it's not just uh, uh, affecting the uh, uh, data encryption uh, by itself, but it also introduces uh, the random salt. And so random salt is basically used uh, for the protection of uh, the actual key. And so the result is not necessarily that you're going to see the entire BSTREAM being scrambled. Well, it is not true. But what it's going to cause is going to scramble or um, is going to affect uh, headers in the data files. And so of course, the duplication will see that uh, the object uh, has changed and they're going to start doing the same old. Reread the entire object, chop it apart, deduplicate it, or try to deduplicate it, and then to start sending uh, data to the backend. So the overall net outcome is uh, that uh, you will see less effective generic duty. Uh, and uh, uh, the um, other side effect, which is pretty critical, is not just uh, the performance drop in the overall backup. So we um, uh, see testimonials that um, people see like uh, up to 50% of the degradation of the performance for the backup on the daily basis. Um, but also it will result in bloating uh, uh, the backend storage consumption. And so uh, um, again, we saw customers basically just uh, turning off duplication, turning off, um, sorry, um, turning off TDE at uh, the uh, source just because the, um, the storage consumption went uh, through the roof. And so they um, basically experienced uh, up to 75% of the overall backend capacity increase. So um, again, uh, the um, incremental forever in virtual synthetics. Um, this part is also becomes much more difficult because you have to deal with a much more extensive processing overall, right? Uh, so the uh, overall arm and backup, so the overall uh, Oracle protection is going to cost you tremendously higher. The uh, uh, another part uh, that also affects not necessarily the bitstream itself, uh, but exactly the same effect like salt, uh, the change in the uh, data file headers. Okay, so if you rotate the key you can enforce the complete re-encryption of the data stream, um, but it's not necessarily, right? So oh, typically when you see the master key rotation doesn't affect like really uh, encrypted data on the table side. Um, but what it does, it uh, replaces an old key with a new one. And again, the effect is gonna be exactly the same. New object in the system, new deduplicated. So I have to read 100% of my data because I don't know if the object inside has changed or not until I gonna run full processing. And so here are the link uh, for the advanced security guys uh, if you guys are curious about this. So uh, back to the recovery plans though. Um, uh, we are, um, again, because of the uniqueness of the approach and because we know what is happening uh, uh, within the database itself. Uh, we went as far that we now can compress encrypted data without uh, re-encrypting. Okay, so we just uh, get to the bitstream. We know how to decrypt it in flight, compress it, and re-encrypt and send it to the backend. So what is the net outcome of this knowledge? It's very simple. Number one, uh, we are much more efficient on the storage consumption automatically. And this is already to the uh, addition of the virtual synthetics and incremental forever, right? Uh, so the overall efficiency without really much affecting of the uh, source system is tremendous. Uh, besides uh, the effectiveness of the storage consumption, what is much more important, we do not break the cycle of the encrypted data. We retain complete integrity and we also do not keep the uh, uh, keys, the encryption keys, at the storage side. So encryption keys handled absolutely separately. We do not touch them and we don't store this on the, on the, on the backend of the recovery appliance. 
So end-to-end -end encryption, end-to-end -end integrity, and efficiency, both performance and storage consumption. Just to um, have like a short recap, okay, and I'm not going to be focusing on the um, on the uh, left side of the slides, and uh, so we just discussed it pretty much in depth, right? What is really important? So one is to understand the difference between BCT, the blockchain tracking, versus traditional duplication. Two, to understand uh, what is actually uh, uh, so quintessential about the uh, virtual synthetics and incremental forever with recovery plans. Uh, we do not run L0s after the first cuts. And even if we have to reveal to the full image, we do it async. So uh, the uh, customer doesn't even know that we had to run another L0. Um, if, for example, uh, the data is going to be completely re encrypted. So, awareness of the TDE data and block level incremental. So, that's basically fundamental blocks uh, uh, of what we have uh, in, inside of the recovery plans. On the contrary, um, TDE will result in both increased backup data volume and significant uh, hit on the performance side, especially on the uh, CPU consumption at the source. Generic dedupe is just generic by nature. Uh, generic dedupe is just built to, to satisfy the needs of the efficiency of deduplication for any data source, including uh, Oracle databases, right? But it doesn't work this way for all sources, as, as we discussed, right? It might work nicely for the next. It might work nicely for the uh, SQL. It might work nicely for the exchanges. It just doesn't work uh, for the Oracle databases because of the uniqueness of the technology that we have to deal with and because of the limitations, the native limitations of the traditional ARM and backups. And so just to wrap it up, uh, um, in the clouds, um, even though that we use uh, the same um, integrated solution between recovery plans, backends, and so the database services on the front end, uh, we have to run TD encrypted uh, from source all the way to the backend. So uh, why it is important? Because uh, OSI guarantees uh, the complete uh, security constructs and practices, and we basically have to adhere. And this is why the importance of the um, TDE knowledge and the understanding of the encryption keys and the understanding of how we can construct virtual synthetics even from the encrypted data comes extremely handy, and it comes with a greater efficiency if using OCI cloud services. And with that, um, Kelly, all yours, please take over. All right. Thanks so much, Alex. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about an actual customer use for um, in the cloud um, and some of their challenges and, you know, what we did to kind of overcome some of this. Um, so let's first look at like an overall view of how complicated things can get in the cloud, depending on, you know, what your approach is. Um, and this particular customer, you know, on first glance, it looks like, okay, they've got a couple, um, couple regions, they've got databases running, but the one key thing here is they were creating different tenancies to enforce, um, separation of duty. So users in tenancy one would not out automatically have uh, permission or rights to do anything in tenancy two or three. Um, and because they were trying to back up to object storage or they were leveraging object storage as their backup destination, they were creating a third tenancy that was just for object storage to get the data out of their primary tenancy where all their administrators work. Um, because you have to be careful if you've got your backups and your database inside the same tenancy where all the admins have, you know, un unwielded uh, access. Um, and to do all this, you know, they were leveraging scripting. So they were scripting for their backups. They were scripting for replication of the backups to a different region. They were scripting for restores into different locations. It was just lots and lots of scripting. Um, and that becomes overwhelming. Um, and the cloud is supposed to make things easier. Um, so we, you know, working with them, you know, they, they gave us some, some uh, requirements and we wanted to kind of work through what we could do in automation. Um, so then if we take a look at 
them using the recovery service. And when I say, you know, they were having to manage a lot of different databases. They have over 500 databases on XSCS, over two petabytes of backup data, um, all in U.S. regions. Um, so the region thing is pretty easy to handle. Um, so this was kind of our approach in phase one. Um, if you look now, we've got um, not a third tenancy. What we have instead is the recovery service lives in an Oracle managed tenancy. And there's a private endpoint that connects the managed tenancy and the client tenancy. So that gives you an air gap solution. And obviously administrators don't have, customer administrators don't have permission to cross that air gapping and do work inside the management tenancy. The only thing that management tenancy does where the recovery service sits, and the recovery service of course is just a large fleet of recovery appliances that have automation sit on top. Um, they only get our man communication. So they get our man backups, they get our man restores, and of course they get real time protection if they choose that. Um, and their requirements were, you know, we want to automate all this. There's a lot of scripting going on in our environment. There's a lot of places for mistakes to happen. Um, it's difficult to monitor. Um, we want our backup data, obviously, to live outside of our tenancy because if something happens to our tenancy, if we have a rogue administrator or if we have a malicious user, or someone comes in and attacks our tenancy, we want to ensure that the backups are safe um, and outside the tenancy. And we also want to enforce a retention lock on the tenancy. One of the, one of the conversations I had early on, you know, is we're doing backups of 500 databases. I can't chase database retention around all over our tenancy. We have to have one rule and that rule gets locked and then all the backups that come in follow that rule, um, which is you know uh, a core tenant of the recovery service. Um, so we have this concept of retention lock, and in this particular case, you create a custom retention policy. You set the retention for however many days, and that tent, that retention gets strictly enforced when you when the retention lock is enabled. Um, it prevents the reduction of the backup time so or the backup retention. So if a backup comes in, it has to stay for 26 days. There's no, uh, there's no way around that. Um, it also prevents databases from simply being moved to another policy to override that retention because that'd be a really simple you know, workaround, right? I'll create a new policy. I'll move the database from the old policy to the new policy. And look, I can reduce the retention of the backups, and if nobody notices, I'll get away with it. Um, and, and these retentions are forced, are enforced, and are forced, even if there's a 72-hour termination option on the database. So when you create a database in uh, the database services in OCI, there's an option that, that asks you what to do with the backups after the database is terminated or deleted. Because we keep the life cycle of those of the database and the backup separate, um, but when retention lock is enabled, it overrides that setting and will always require the backups to follow the retention that's set in the policy. You can increase the tenancy, or the I'm sorry, the retention or the policy. Um, you can easily increase that. Um, so if you know you have a new requirement in your uh, tenancy for you know a particular policy, you can go up. You just cannot go down. To prevent mistakes, um, we allow we have a fourteen day grace period for new databases that are introduced to the policy. That gives you time to understand what the space utilization is going to look like. Um, with the recovery service, when the database lands, we give you space utilization information and we do a projection into the future for your retention period. So if you say, I want to keep the data for 30 days, even though you've only backed up the data for five or six days, we can tell you what the storage consumption will look like in the future based on the behavior of the database over the last few days. So it's predictive. And this retention applies to all users, even the tenancy admin. So an all-powerful tenancy admin can't come in and change the policy, move the database out of the policy, 
um, delete the policy, delete the database, and delete the backups. Um, that can all be controlled, um, and is and is you know the tenancy. Uh, I'm sorry, the retention policy lock is enforced all the time. So let's look at some of the benefits here of the recovery service. You've got immutable backups that live outside the customer tenancy. That means there's no chance for alteration or tampering of backups because you only get our man communication between the database and the customer tenancy and the recovery service. Um, we have strict retention control. So that means the customer can choose custom retention periods and we will enforce those for the backups. Um, there's also strict role-based access. You can do some really powerful things with the uh, with groups and tagging um, and permissions inside of OCI so that you can restrict who can perform backup and restore operations. Um, and you can actually split that in half. You could have one group of administrators that are, can only do backups and another group that may get backup and restore. Um, so that's really easy control. You can do that at the compartment level. You can do that through tagging of the resources. Um, the recovery set service also has the capability of having sub-second RPO. Um, and that is basically real-time protection of the database. And that allows you to recover up to the last transaction for critical databases. You want to be able, you want to know that if someone tampered with that database, the last transaction is the backup of the database, not a scheduled backup that runs in the background. And then, of course, all this is integrated with OCI automation. So you don't have to manage any kind of manual process. You set a few options in the UI, um, and the automation behind the scenes takes care of all your uh, backup uh, interactions with our man. Um, it can also do restores. Um, and the automation also reports metrics up to uh, the OCI Metrics Explorer, which you can set alarms, and that gives you the capability of granular observability and notification. So you have this nice dashboard that shows you exactly what's going on with your database, and you can set alerts. And then there's a low price point in all of this. Um, the recovery service costs essentially the same thing, is the same as the object storage in OCI. Um, and that's the next thing I want to talk about because there's a lot of confusion around um, how how much it costs to store data. Um, and th that's one thing that we want to make very obvious with the recovery service is exactly how much data is being stored for the database. So you can make business decisions around, you know, is the data in this database worth this amount of storage that's being used? Um, so... Let's just talk about the two different paradigms. Um, as Alex mentioned, we've got an incremental forever paradigm. So we do the full backup once, and then we're doing incrementals forever. And then we're building out this virtual full concept behind the scenes, um, which means that each daily backup can be purged independently. If they, they don't rely on each other, um, each one standalone, so you can easily purge backups when they're no longer needed. You don't have to keep anything extra around versus an object storage or traditional approach to backups has this concept of weekly fulls, which means you're revisiting a lot of data. You have daily incrementals, another weekly full, and this just kind of repeats over and over, which means you have to have extra backups retained to, to give you your recoverability window. And you know that, that makes a lot of people scratch their head, like, okay, I have a 14-day retention. I'm only going to keep 14 days worth of backups. Well, that's not entirely true. And so let me show you why. So if we take a 14 day window, um, and if you look at that, if we look at the recovery service, there's no extra backups needed because everything's represented as a full. We can just chop off uh, the retention period on the day uh, that is necessary. So 14 day recovery window, we can just keep the backups that are inside. There's no, none of these backups on the left need to be kept around. Um, because each one of these is a standalone full. In the case of object storage and traditional backup, you have to keep these extra incrementals and weekly fulls around because to restore the Saturday backup, you need all the backup incremental backups that precede that as well as the full that precedes that. So for a 14-day retention period, you actually have to keep 
21 days in total. So you have to keep an extra week's worth of backups to cover that window. So that's extra data sitting around. And that's one of the ways that we, you know, we optimize and reduce cost is by not keeping extra data around. You, we don't need it. So your 14 days just becomes 14 days worth of retention and not having to tag on these extra days to cover the recovery window um, and the extra backups that are associated with backups that are inside that window. So of course that, you know, that gives us a benefit for operational cost and um, actual physical storage cost because we're, there's no interdependency and we can just get rid of data as we need to. And in the case of object storage and traditional backup, you have to retain extra data because they're not inter there's an interdependency between all of them and they're not standalone. So like I mentioned, if you want to restore the Saturday, you have to restore Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then Saturday to do the recovery for Saturday. So there's a lot of extra data. Um, so I'll talk about this um, in a different session, but th there's not only a storage cost, but there's a there's a, a little bit of an unpredictable uh, restore performance characteristic as well. So, and I'll talk about that in an upcoming video or an upcoming webcast. Okay, so now if we take the same, you know, 14 day retention for the recovery service, and then you have to have 21 days for object storage, and we do the comparison of that, um, I'm going to do an example without compression, um, just because the numbers stay simple, and we don't have to, you know, scratch our head too much uh, of, about the numbers. So we metered uh, we use the same metering model with the recovery service and object storage just to keep things simple, because if not, you're going to be scratching your head trying to figure out like what um, what this backup, what, what backups are uh, stored and how long they're stored. Um, so we're using a metered full concept, even though we're not taking a meter a full, we're using a metered full once a week. So that the paradigm stays the same and the numbers are easy to easy to follow. Um, so we've got this, you know, 1000 gig database. We're going to keep it for 14 days. There's one extra in the system always because you wait for a new one to arrive before you purge an old one. So we keep that concept inside of recovery service. Um, and that gives us our, you know, 3000 gigs or three terabytes on both sides. The changes start to happen when you look at the dailies, right? So if there are fulls and dailies, if this concept's being you know used from a metering perspective on both sides. Notice that there's 12 daily database backups here. There's 18 over here because we've got to cover that entire window, that extra seven days. Um, so 120 gigs versus 180 gigs. Then for redo logs, there's 14. Over here, you've got 21 because you have to keep that that full window. If you don't have archive redo logs, you lose part of your window. Um, so you've got 210 gigs versus 315. So that there's your total usage, 330 and 3495. And these are the SKUs that get uh, leveraged. So there's the SKU for the recovery service. Um, so that gives you 10190. And then the object storage is a two SKU model. So there's the storage SKU and then the software SKU and gives you 106. Um, so the uh, the recovery service is, is cheaper. Um, overall, from a monthly billing perspective, you're going to end up with a lower bill when you're using recovery service compared to object storage. And we're not even counting all of the operational improvements. So the database isn't under as much strain um, because we don't produce the full physical full backups anymore. This is just looking at storage costs. Um, and again, I'll in a in the next office hours after the holidays, I'll go through all of these different metrics that we can look at um, for how much you actually save across your entire environment with the recovery service. So this is just a simple cost example. So now let's go back to the customer. Um, let's look at phase two because we did phase one with them. Um, and we've got, you know, single region doing backups, did 
proof of concept, all of that is working. Um, they've got um, backups running of all their uh, infrastructure uh, in phase one. Now moving out to phase two, things become a little more complicated in phase two. Um, and we've got some more work to do, uh, but this is the customer's environment in phase two. And you know, one of the things that they'll need to do is cross region recoverability because they've got some primaries and standbys. And unfortunately, you know, things happen in different environments and sometimes you have to rebuild a standby or your standby becomes the primary database and then you have to rebuild what was your old primary. There are all these different scenarios that we have to be prepared for. Um, so we've got to be able to recover backups from wherever they happen to live um, in these different regions for the databases. And then, of course, the other thing they have to do is be able to restore and clone from one of their, I'll call it production locations, into their non-prod um, or their test dev. So this is phase two. We're working through all the details of phase two um, with the customer. Um, and then along with that comes some, you know, some things that we've got underway. Um, so there's this concept of OCI network security groups that's being uh, deployed in the next uh, rollout of the recovery service in the next month. Um, so the instead of uh, using uh, the security rules, you can use network security groups um, where the recovery service will be directly integrated into that. You'll see rules for the recovery service um, in your network security groups. Um, for the customer today, we're working through a scripting process for restore the primary and standby, but that automation is coming in the next few months in the first half of calendar year 24. So the next few months ahead, we'll have primary standby all integrated into automation, including cross-region restore. So that means that they can get away from the scripting process that they're using today. And then, of course, cross-tenancy restore which is how they have their environment set up is very, is very similar because of their network configurations. Um, they are different tenancies, but there's a full communication channel between the tenancies, so it's very easy to communicate back and forth. These are some of the resources that we'll include um, with the presentation, um, and we'll post these out on Ask Tom. Um, all the different uh, pieces of information covering Alex's TDE uh, presentation. And then there are, is a bunch of stuff for the recovery service itself. There's a deeper introduction. Um, there's uh, We did a little bit of a cost analysis in a previous Ask Tom. There's the cost estimator and then, of course, the documentation. I've also got some product demos for backup, monitoring, and restore. Um, so you can see exactly what the uh, um, what the UI looks like and what information comes back to you uh, in the UI. Okay. Now we're open for questions. I don't know if there were questions along the way. Alex, is there anything that we need to cover that came in? Yeah, there was an excellent question, actually, and I um, responded, but I, I think it's worth saying to, uh, to elaborate so in depth. Uh, what is the difference between the retention lock and recovery window compliance? So recovery window compliance is an on-premises recovery uh, recovery appliance concept. Um, and retention lock is very similar. The difference between the recovery service and the recovery appliance, though, is with the recovery appliance, you have physical access to the systems in your data center. With the recovery service, you don't have that physical access. So same concept, just a different implementation, um, but the same results. Um, and we use retention lock in the cloud because um, there's already the concept of retention lock with other services in the cloud. So we want to use same concepts, same uh, monitoring, same implementation of other cloud services that are already available. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't see any other questions. Um, um, oh, here's another one. Here's another one. DBs across XSCS in the same region, able to duplicate in XCS, 
Pupil JP. CS in the same region. So you're trying to do a point in time duplication of a PDB to another XSCS in the same region. Um, that should be possible. I believe there's PDB. Um, so it's not in the main UI, but in the API for XSCS, I believe there is a PDB um, construct where you can uh, manipulate PDB from restore and cloning perspectives. Okay, there's another question. Let me read through it here real quick. Yeah, that's a good one. That's about the deletes of workflows in uh, the cloud, I guess. No, this, I think, um, I believe this is more, so the question is, um, when you say my backups are immutable, just uh, using allow backup deletion no as an option in the policy. So that's an on-premises construct um, where you can, where the, the on-premises recovery appliance user can make the decision to allow DBAs to delete or not delete uh, backups. Um, and that's a policy setting. In the cloud, essentially that's always on. There is no option in the policy in the recovery service in the cloud. It's always enabled so that the database administrators cannot delete, cannot arbitrarily delete the backup. So that's always turned on. Um, and uh, there's more to having an on-premises recovery appliance uh, set up as immutable. Um, so if you read through the documentation, there's three different levels. Uh, the first one is the policy, as you're mentioning. Um, the second is... Um, enabling the uh, recovery appliance, um, the, the compliance retention window. Um, and then the third level is enabling quorum access because on-premises, uh, an administrator of the recovery appliance left unchecked without a quorum can simply log in as a super user and it's, it's a system, right? If they get in as root, they can wreak havoc on a system. So um, by enabling Quorum, uh, a single administrator can't just log in as a super user like root. Um, we limit it to named accounts and it requires a quorum of administrators, uh, named administrators to approve a super user elevation. And that's really where you start getting into a, an, a state where you're truly immutable. Um, it's not just the policy setting. You have to do some additional configurations on the on-premises recovery appliance because uh, you don't want just an administrator to come in as a root. Um, and then the second part of that, and, and in the cloud, that's already like you as a, as a user, you don't get access to the recovery service in a way that would give you super user privileges. Um, and we have all that managed in the back end so that a single user doesn't get that access. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, also, when using ZFS object storage as long term retention, do we have to? Um, so, if you're sending data, so the second part of the question is about using ZFS object storage for long term retention. So, this is a configuration where the recovery appliance on premises is using an on-premises ZFS object storage as a long-term retention destination. Um, and this is this has a very similar, there's a very similar configuration that you have to do on ZFS. Because if you're sending backups from the recovery appliance to ZFS, and there's an administrator in your environment that can log into the ZFS as a super user, then those backups could be compromised as well. So just setting the allow backup deletion policy to no would keep a DBA from an RMAN prompt perspective from uh, deleting backups. It would not keep the an administrator from law uh, a ZFS super user from logging in and manipulating or deleting backups. You also need to set the retention lock on the ZFS and do the configuration to make sure that super users can't log into that storage destination and manipulate storage. 
I know that's a very long answer, but you've got two layers of, you've got multiple layers in the recovery appliance and multiple layers on ZFS. You have to make sure both of those are configured to keep a su super user from getting into the system. Okay, any other questions? Okay, if there are no other questions, uh, we'll be back after the holiday season um, and we'll talk more about the recovery service then, some upcoming functionality with the recovery appliance. Um, if you have any suggestions for topics that you would like to have covered in the office hours, please give us feedback on the Ask Tom website. We're more than happy to entertain, you know, interesting topics for you. Um, so if you have anything that you want to cover in, in future Ask Tom office hours for the recovery service or the recovery appliance or RMAN or uh, Oracle Secure Backup, that all comes under the same our, our team. Um, so we can, you know, produce sessions based on your feedback. So thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful weekend um, and we'll talk to you next time. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you again.